action becomes the main arm in furthering self-improvement. Recognizing one's value is important at the start of self-improvement, but for any real improvement to be achieved, regard for the self will have to be relegated to second place. Unless a stage is reached at which self-regard ceases to be the main motivating force, any improvement achieved will never be sufficient to satisfy the individual. In fact, as a man grows and improves, his entire existence centers increasingly on what he does and how, while who does it becomes of ever decreasing importance. The difficulty of changing an earlier pattern of action. A man tends to regard his self-image as something bestowed upon him by nature, although it is, in fact, the result of his own experience. His appearance, voice, way of thinking, environment, his relationship to space and time, to choose at random, are all taken for granted as realities born with him. Whereas every important element in the individual's relationship to other people and to society in general is the result of extensive training. The arts of walking, speaking, reading, and of recognizing three dimensions in a photograph are skills the individual accumulates over a period of many years. Each of them depends on chance and on the place and period of his birth. The acquisition of a second language is not as easy as that of the first, and the pronunciation of the newly formed language will be marked by the influence of the first. The sentence structure of the first language will impose itself on the second. Every pattern of action that has become fully assimilated will interfere with the pattern of subsequent actions. Difficulties arise, for instance, when a person learns to sit according to the custom of some nation other than his own. As these early patterns of sitting are not the result of heredity alone, but derive from the chance and circumstances of birth, the difficulties involved lie less in the nature of the new habit than in the changing of habits of body, feeling, and mind from their established patterns. This holds true for almost any change of habit, whatever its origin. What is meant here, of course, is not the simple substitution of one activity by another, but a change in the way that an act is performed, a change in its whole dynamics so that the new method will be in every respect as good as the old. There is no awareness of many parts of the body. A person who lies down on his back and tries to sense his entire body systematically, that is turning his attention to every limb and part of the body in turn, finds that certain sections respond easily while others remain mute or dull and beyond the range of his awareness. It is thus easy to sense the fingertips or lips, but much harder to sense the back of the head at the nape between the ears. Naturally, the degree of difficulty is individual depending on the form of the self-image. Generally speaking, it will be difficult to find a person whose whole body is equally accessible to his awareness. The parts of the body that are easily defined in the awareness are those that serve man daily, while the parts that are dull or mute in his awareness play only an indirect role in his life and are almost missing from his self-image when he is in action. A person who cannot sing at all cannot feel this function in his self-image except by an, ex an effort of intellectual extrapolation. He is not aware of any vital connection between the hollow space in his mouth and his ears or his breathing, as does the singer. A man who cannot jump will not be aware of those parts of the body involved that are clearly defined to a man who is able to jump. 
A complete self-image is a rare and ideal state. A complete self-image would involve full awareness of all the joints in the skeletal structure, as well as of the entire surface of the body, at the back, the sides, between the legs, and so on. This is an ideal condition and hence a rare one. We can all demonstrate to ourselves that everything we do is in accordance with the limits of our self-image and that this image is no more than a narrow sector of the ideal image. It is also easily observed that the relationship between the different parts of the self-image changes from activity to activity and from position to position. This is not so easily seen under common conditions owing to their very familiarity, but it is sufficient to imagine the body poised for an unfamiliar movement in order to realize that the legs, for instance, will appear to change in length, thickness, and other aspects from movement to movement. Estimation of size varies in different limbs. If we try, for instance, to indicate the length of our mouth with eyes closed by means of the thumb and first finger of the right hand, and with both hands using the first finger of each, we shall obtain two different values. Not only will neither measurement correspond to the actual length of the mouth, but both may be several times too large or too small. Again, if we try with eyes closed to estimate the thickness of our chest by placing our hands this distance apart, horizontally and vertically, we are likely to get two quite different values, neither of which need be anywhere near the truth. Close your eyes and stretch out your arms in front of you, about the width of the shoulders apart, and then imagine the point at which the ray of light traveling from the index finger of the right hand to the left eye will cross the ray of light traveling from the index finger of the left hand to the right eye. Now, try to mark this crossing point using the thumb and index finger of the right hand. It is unlikely that the place chosen will seem correct when you open your eyes to look. There are few people whose self-image is sufficiently complete for them to be able to identify the correct spot in this way. What is more, if the experiment is repeated using the thumb and index finger of the left hand, a different location will most likely be chosen for the same point. The average approximation is far from the best that can be achieved. It is easy to show by means of unfamiliar movements that our self-image is in general far from the degree of completeness and accuracy that we ascribe to it. Our image is formed through familiar actions in which approximation to reality is improved by bringing into play several of the senses that tend to correct each other. Thus, our image is more accurate in the region in front of our eyes than behind us or above our heads and in familiar positions such as sitting or standing. If the difference between imagined values or positions, one estimates with the eyes closed and one with the eyes open, is not more than 20 or 30%, accuracy may be considered average, though not satisfactory. Individuals act in accordance with their subjective image. The difference between image and reality may not be as much as 300% and even more. Persons who normally hold their chests in a position as though air had been expelled by the lungs in an exaggerated fashion, with their chests both flatter than it should be and too flat to serve them efficiently, are likely to indicate its depth as several times larger than it is if asked to do so with their eyes closed. That is, the excessive 
flatness appears right to them because any thickening of the chest appears to them a demonstrably exaggerated effort to expand their lungs. Normal expansion feels to them as a deliberately blown up chest would to another person. The way a man holds his shoulders, head, and stomach, his voice and expression, his stability and manner of presenting himself, all are based on his self-image. But this image may be cut down or blown up to fit the mask by which its owner would like to be judged by his peers. Only the man himself can know which part of his outward appearance is fictitious and which is genuine. However, not everybody is capable of identifying himself easily, and one may be greatly helped by the experience of others. Systematic correction of the image is more useful than correction of single actions. From what has been said about the self-image, it emerges that systematic correction of the image will be a quicker and more efficient approach than the correction of single actions and errors and modes of behavior, the incidence of which increases as we come to deal with smaller errors. The establishment of an initial more or less complete, although approximate image will make it possible to improve the general dynamics instead of dealing with individual actions piecemeal. This improvement may be likened to correcting playing on an instrument that is not properly tuned. Improving the general dynamics of the image becomes the equivalent of tuning the piano itself, as it is much easier to play correctly on an instrument that is in tune than on one that is not. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter on the self-image, and I'll be putting out a video soon, um, or maybe more than one video with commentaries on this section of the book before we move on to the following section, which is entitled Strata of Development. Thanks for watching, everyone.